Hi, this is Tony Agnesi, and welcome to this edition of The Storytellers. This is episode number 15 here in our third season. A couple of quick notes before we begin. The Storytellers debuts on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. on the Fiat Ministry Network and on Facebook Live and YouTube, and at 6.15 at my YouTube page, at Tony Agnesi. Uh, the radio program is in its third year. It airs at 4 p.m. on the Living Bread Network stations. And we're very happy to be back for our third year with Living Bread Radio. And for the second year, we'll be airing here in my hometown on Wadsworth Community Radio. The show airs at 10 and 4 on Sundays. I want to remind you about my new YouTube video series called Five Minutes with Tony. It's at my YouTube page at TonyAgnesi.com. We uh, post the new reflection every Monday and Thursday. And uh, so if you can get on there, there's 36 of them up so far. And if you subscribe, you won't miss a single one. Well, each week on The Storytellers, we feature an inspirational guest discussing not only their personal faith journey and the ministries they share as authors and speakers and bloggers, radio and television hosts. Today's guest is no exception. Kim, Kim Zember is the author of a book entitled Restless Heart, My Struggle with Life and sexuality. See if I can get it up there without getting too much reflection. And uh, Kim um, is a speaker internationally, and she talks about love and the freedom that she's found in her life. And uh, uh, her book is extremely transparent, and it's written in a style that I just fell in love with right from the outset. And Kim, uh, it's an honor to have you on the program. Thank you for joining us here on The Storytellers. Oh, Tony, it's truly an honor. Looking forward to it. I, uh, I, 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 I mentioned the book, and I just love the way you write it. I want to get into the backstory first, but just a, a, a thought. The way you, uh, you, you write is just so uh, open and transparent. I like mm -hmm. how you chunk it up into uh, – in, uh, I'm one of those people that um, – all of my books are written uh, 700 words at a time. So I, mm. I, I, I learned very early on that my brain can't handle more than that. So uh, Yeah, bite size is uh... – Always nice. Bite so. size is great. Well, let's talk a little bit about your personal faith journey. I, I know that you had pretty, uh, pretty much a normal, uh, you know, childhood, and and uh, you know what happened, uh, what changed in high school that that uh, that started you on this journey you've been on. Well, um, yeah, same sex attraction uh, really kind of rose to the surface my senior year in high school, and. Uh, there's a lot of backstory, of course, but I, I do find it's important to share, you know, in my personal journey, um, I did not have any abuse in my life. Um, I was never molested. I didn't have any uh, physical or spiritual or emotional abuse. Grew up with, uh, you know, great Catholic family and um, and not just Catholic by title. Um, my, my mom and dad both loved the Lord. It was very clear in how they lived their lives um, and, and how they raised us kids and had two older brothers. And yeah, I mean, really just kind of a cookie cutter family, you know, um, but it was my senior year in high school. And, you know, I, I kind of struggled because I, you know, I was attracted to men. Um, I was drawn to women always. I always remember a draw to women and I wouldn't say it was sexual. I was just drawn to them. Um, and, but it was my, my senior year in high school. And, you know, I had dated before that I had dated guys, but I, I realized they wanted to have sex. Um, and, <laughs> you know, that's kind of the genetic makeup and, and I get that, but I really did want to save myself for marriage. And so I was like, you know what? I don't think this dating thing is going to be working in high school. You know, I'm just going to, if, if this is how it's going to end, um, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll skip that. I don't need it. Um, but in that I was lacking, um, you know, all my friends were dating and, um, and I just started to feel lonely. I, I, you know, wanted someone like everybody else had someone and, um, I'm not saying that that desire, you know, to have someone led me to now same sex, you know, relationship, but there's a lot of different, you know, components and pieces that, that no doubt came together. Uh, but the reality was I had a desire for a woman, uh, a young woman in, in my grade, uh, my senior year, and I started entertaining it in my mind. And, um, and then I took that to action. And so I knew, I did know, Tony, that what I was thinking and the feelings and the desires I had, I, I did know that they were not of the Lord. I, I did know that God did not put those desires into my heart. Um, but also, no, I didn't really either. You know, um, I didn't want to have same-sex attraction, um, but I had it. And um, and so, you know, I didn't really want to go to my parents to talk to them because they knew what they would say. I knew what the church taught. I knew what the Bible had said. And so it was like, 
you know, I, I didn't want to hear that because I didn't want to do that. Uh, I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I wish I could say differently, but that ain't true. And so, um, yeah, it was my senior year when I actually, uh, had my first, uh, encounter with, with the same sex, uh, in a physical way. And it had opened something now for me that I would now long and crave. And so long for and, and craved and I couldn't shake it. It was like, literally it came in like a rushing wind and, um, I just, I wanted to be with that girl that didn't work out, but I just now had this, you know, it, it's almost like it hit a taste button. It was like, Oh, I like that, you know? And, and, you know, I, I, I relate a lot to food, you know, if I never had cheesecake, I probably would never crave cheesecake, you know? And, um, and some things you try and you don't like, um, but then there's some things you try and you do like, and, and this was something, um, I love the intimacy. Um, and I'm not talking about sexual intimacy. I'm talking about just intimacy. She understood me. We got, you know, there wasn't a, well, we, you know, she wants something from me, you know? Um, so it was kind of safe. <laughs> well, it was safe in some ways, um, but I didn't know it was a sin. Just like premarital sex, I don't know why I thought, you know, in my mind, I was like, you know what? Everybody else around me is having sex, doing drugs, getting drunk. Is it really that big of a deal to kiss a girl? I mean, honestly. Um, and so I justified. I was like, you know what? It's better than X, Y, or Z. Um, and so I started kind of comparing and, and stacking up sin next to each other. Like, you know, this is it's not that big of a deal and it'll, it'll, it won't go anywhere. Well, did you ever, <laughs> did you ever, uh, uh, entertain the thought of coming out as um, no, 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 no. Um, because, you know, for me it was, I did have the desires, but you know, from, from even that young age of 17, I didn't know it wasn't who I was. Right. Um, and so I just always kind of had that by the grace of God, had that dis dividing factor that was like, okay, you have this desire, but it's not who you are. So for me, coming out was not something because I was like, well, I'm not going to probably live this lifestyle. I don't know, because I didn't want to live in sin. And, and I mean, no offense to that, but look, th there's sinful desires we have. If I choose to act on them, I'm now living a, I'm living a sinful lifestyle. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, and so for me, no, that wasn't, that wasn't on the radar. I actually was the opposite. I was like, I'm gonna hide this because I knew it wasn't right. And so I didn't want to promote something that wasn't good. And so no, I hit it. And that was, that was a big issue. Yeah. Yeah. We all have these uh, sinful desires. I mean, mm -hmm. it, and it doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be a same sex attraction. It could be any number of things. It could be that cheesecake. If you're, you know, right. if you're trying to get your, uh, your blood pressure down and your cholesterol right. organized. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, we all we all have those types of desires. So, uh, how how long did that relationship last, and then wh where did you go from there? Yeah, so it didn't it didn't last actually. It was it was a one night thing, and um, and it wrecked me because I was like, I mean, it just really messed with me. I don't mean she messed with me, but just everything, and and then not being able to share it with anyone or choosing not to share it with anyone um, was something. Now I was battling on my own on the inside, and so um, it, the. Being with women ended up, now it opened up. Once I was with her, it was like, okay, I need to feed this craving. Like I, I need to, this needs to happen. And so I just went, I, I dated guys on the forefront and then for years um, was with women behind the scenes, um, never out in the open. Um, and really the women that I was with, it wasn't like, oh, you were just running around fulfilling a physical need. No, I really liked these women. I wanted to be in relationship with them. And to be honest, the physical part was always secondary. It wasn't, it wasn't forefront. It was like, I just wanted a partner in life. And I, for some reason, felt more comfortable with women than I did men. And, and I, you would think, you know, people are like, oh, maybe it's your relationship with your dad. I'm like, I have a phenomenal relationship with my dad and my two brothers. Um, and I have a phenomenal relationship with my mom. Nothing's perfect, but I, you know, it wasn't like, I didn't feel it was a lack. I know now it was a lack of my relationship with the Lord that I was trying to fill a void that he really is my partner in life. Um, and I was trying to fill that void with, with friends that were women. And then I turned it into more, um, but it went on for years, Tom. But, but you, you also had, you know, you also dated men and, and I know, um, you know, at one point, uh, a, a man entered your life and you, and you, uh, you know, made a, a considerable move in that direction. Talk, talk yeah. about that period. Yeah. In that transition. <laughs> Well, I, I met a guy that was, he was just wonderful. And it was, it was, he was different. Um, he, he, he wanted to have sex, of course, right. But he did more than his desire. He wanted to live for the Lord. And so he, he you know, right. When we started kind of hanging out, he's like, you know, I, I don't know if this bothers you or not, but like, I, I want to wait till marriage. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So it was kind of a safe zone for me. I'm like, okay, I, 
all right. And so I kind of opened my heart to him, you know, and um, started started being a little more. He was super attractive, um, great guy, and solidly Christian. I'm thinking, hmm, okay. But I still now on the side was feeding this thing with women. And so it was it was this wrestle, you know, it's like my flesh wanted one thing, which was women. And then there was something deeper within me that was like, Man, this is real. You know, what, what I was starting to experience with him. Um, it led to um, a lot and in, in details are, of course, in the book. But um, he actually told me he loved me. And that freaked me out. I'm like, why? This guy was so solid, so down to earth. And I was materialistic. I was living on the surface. Um, it was all about money and what I had and how I looked. And I'm thinking, why does this guy who doesn't, isn't trying to get something from me. Why is he doing this? And um, long story short, <laughs> he asked me to, to talk to God and uh, the God would tell me why he loves me. And I was like, it's weird. And so I talked to God, I asked God to show me a heart and I ended up moving to Ethiopia <laughs> after that. And that, that started a whole nother thing, um, which started to open my heart to something more than putting a person in my empty place. Right? I, I, I recall reading or, or hearing at one point, you, you mentioned that you may have used him as kind of a God replacement. Uh, talk about I that did. for a second. I would say I actually used him not as a God replacement, but more of like a God funnel. Um, it was, he was like the connector. He had his relationship with God. And then I just hooked onto his tunnel, you know, and it was like, it was this pass through instead of a direct connect to God. I, I was feeding off of his relationship with the Lord. I was feeding, which, which can be a beautiful thing if it then connects you to God directly, right. Uh, mm -hmm. To Jesus. And so, in that, that is where I was going wrong. So now I needed him, right? Because without him, I was not connected to the Lord on my own. Um, so he was kind of this bridge per se. Um, and I ended up marrying him. So I ended up um, getting married. Uh, you know, I told, by the way, I did tell him everything. And, and like I said, it's in the book with the details, but I did tell him that I was cheating on him with a woman. Um, and it was one woman at the time I had, you know, been doing whatever I was doing for about almost two years with her. Um, and I told him and you know, we had long discussions, but he still says, I want to marry you. You're, you're the one for me. And again, oh boy, I'm not dealing with this. You know, like I knew I wasn't dealing with something inside. Um, and so, yeah, we ended up getting married and um, it's about a year into our marriage. Um, and actually when I did get married, before I got married, uh, the night before I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I promise you, I will never cheat on this man with a woman. You know, and those words were not forced. That came from my heart. I did not want to cheat on him. And I knew that if I were to, that it'd be with a woman. And um, I didn't ask Jesus for help. I didn't ask him for strength. I said, I wouldn't do it. I thought I had to do it in my own strength. I thought I just had to fight it. I thought I had to push it down, ignore it, you know. Um, and that is not what the word of God says at all regarding any temptation or any sin. Um, and so, yeah, within uh, about a year of our marriage, maybe a little bit over, um, I ended up cheating on him with a married woman. Mm -hmm. Restless Heart, My Struggle with Life and Sexuality is uh, her new book. Kim Zember is my guest. During this time, did you still go to go to church? Uh, Every Sunday. Sunday or? Every Sunday. And I didn't want to miss it. I was out on my own. I was selling real estate uh, from 18 on, you know, so I was making a lot of money and, and this and that and, and also going to Ethiopia. But I had a desire for God. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to live the way he was inviting me to. I was like, I'll do the holiness thing later. And I didn't know about St. Augustine at the time. Um, and if I had, I'd been like, hmm, okay, you know, if I maybe would have read confessions at a young age, maybe something would have changed. But, you know, it goes back to that whole thing that, you know, was burning in St. Augustine's flesh really was make me chase just not right now. And that's what I was telling him. Actually, the book, I almost titled it. Um, but through prayer and discussion, it, it became restless heart, but it was going to be not yet God. Um, because that was really what I was saying. My whole journey was just not yet God. Later, later God, you know. Um, like that but, country song, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go now, right? Exactly, yeah. You know, and so I just, I, I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I was living a life of feeding the flesh. And when the word says that you become a slave to your sin, I was starting to realize that. I could not shake this on my own. I could not cut it out on my own. I couldn't stop on my own. Uh, I was consumed. And I don't blame anybody but myself. I chose to act on desires. I was also fascinated. There's a whole nother theme going through the book, and that is uh, is Ethiopia and your motivation. Uh, how, what motivated you to, you know, leave California and 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 head to Africa and work with young children there? Um, 
uh, you, you know, what, what was that motivation and, and, you know, what, what was the attraction that drew you to Ethiopia? Well, I was honestly tired of living for myself. Like it was, though it worked for a while, it was like, okay, is this it? Is that it, God? Like, really, am I put on this earth to just get everything for me, take care of myself, you know, and me, me, me. And, and so when I asked the Lord to show me my heart, he showed me a memory I had when I was a child. Um, and that involved Africa. And so I said, all right, I'm going. <laughs> uh, I took that. A lot of people thought you were nuts, right? A lot of people oh, yeah. kind of questioned. I thought I was nuts. I mean, I, I really did. And I still <laughs> kind of do. Um, but I'm thankful that, you know, and it's, it's so cool because, you know, some of the ideas we have for ourselves, you know, it kind of, maybe the glory can fall back to us, but this was such a thing that was so far off my radar. I was not a traveler. I didn't, I didn't care to take pictures or, you know, it wasn't a tourist thing. It was like, there was something I'm like, I'm going to find out if this is real. Worst case, worst case, I was wrong. And it wasn't God. <laughs> that wasn't the case. It's been 13 years that I've been in Ethiopia now and um, have a ministry there serving uh, little, little kids and, and their single moms. So um, yeah, really what, what that trip, what God did on that trip and, and has continued to do um, was he showed me that all the reasons he made me the way he made me, whatever gifts he, he's given me, was was actually given for a bigger purpose. It was to serve others and not myself. And I started to experience that. Not only did I start to live it, I started to receive the fruits of it. Like, oh my gosh, wait, I'm going to bed and I have peace. I have joy. I'm like excited to see what God can do tomorrow. Um, and I never experienced that because I was living, I mean, just in torment when I was doing this double life business. And um, and so when I started to, to start give of myself, whatever God has given me to give away, I started to find real life. I mean, people would thank me. Oh, thank you for, you know, cause we did food. We, you know, supplied meals and education and all the things for the kids cause they didn't have it. And they would thank me. I'm like, you have no idea. You guys are like, God is giving me life through serving you. You don't understand, you know, and, and that might sound selfish and Lord forgive me, but I was, I'd never found that connection. And I believe that's how the Lord works anyways. When he blesses one of his children, he's blessing another. The subtitle of my second book is called uh, Turning Your Misery into Ministry. That's about what you've done, right? Well, that's what the Lord has done. Yeah. And, he, you know, I think he invites us all to that. It's whether or not we accept the invitation. Mm -hmm. There was at one point in time you sold everything and kind of moved there. Uh, was that, yeah. where did that, when did that come about? Yeah, I was 23. So I was still dating that guy. And, and I was just, I, I couldn't deny what I, well, I could, um, but I didn't want to deny what, what the Lord was doing. And, and, um, you know, I, yeah, sold my house, sold my car, sold everything I had and I moved to Ethiopia and I was like, okay, let's go Lord. I don't know. I don't know what this looks like. And, and keep in mind, I wasn't chatting with him too much. He was talking a lot and I thought I was kind of crazy. I'm like, I don't know. Like, why am I hearing all this? You know? Um, but every time I, I walk in faith that I was hearing him, you know, there was fruit coming and I'm like, okay, this is, this is different. Um, and I was, I was, yeah, it was, it was life for the first time for me, to be honest. Um, everything I did before seemed fake, um, though it really all happened. And I don't mean, you know, relationships, there was some, you know, with my family and, and some close friends, but, but really the things I was doing on the day to day, just no longer, well, they didn't seem as real. Um, and they surely weren't as enticing or as palatable for me anymore. Um, it was like I had tasted and seen something that really made all the other things I was doing pale in comparison. Kim Zember is my guest, My Struggle with Life and Sexuality. Restless Heart is the title of her book. I was interested to see too, Kim, that uh, you take the net proceeds of the book sales and they go to your uh, particular charity, which I think is just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful thought. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think <laughs> I don't want any money, you know, the Lord, if, if it can fuel what he's doing in Ethiopia, amen. Um, but you know, I, I didn't write the book for uh, book sales. I didn't write it. I actually didn't want to write it. Um, because who does, right. Who wants to write a book of all the junk that, that I've done, you know, that we've done, um, and put it out there for the world to rip apart, you know, but, um, I needed a book like this. I needed a book of somebody being real, um, with the struggle and, and not, sugarcoat things and and just really expose their heart um and and let me walk through and journey their journey um and see if any bit of my life correlates i i wish i had something like that um and so that's why i wrote it i feel like the lord asked me to i mean if it was one person that read it amen i'd, I'd write it again for one and so um i well, was you're very transparent person. very transparent in your writing and 
I, I think it's 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 very brave to be able to step out that way. And I'm sure that many pen, uh, people will benefit who read the book uh, from the fact that you're just right out there, very transparent and and tell the, the story as it is. I think mm -hmm. that's a wonderful aspect of the book. Uh, in addition to that wonderful writing style you have that I just yes. uh, just absolutely love. The, the book ends, um, interestingly enough, with a chapter called Unfinished Ending. Mm -hmm. And it kind of just says to me that the story continues. Is that what you intended there? It is, yeah. I mean, for me, yeah, sure. There's been great successes. The Lord has been victorious in my life um, and and, um, but it's not over. It's not over. I still struggle. Um, you know, I may not struggle with same sex attraction like I used to, but I got struggles. I'll never be free from struggles, but I have a savior who will never leave me. And so for me, I, I think, you know, sometimes we read these things like, oh, and look and happily ever after. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, for eternity, but right now on earth, um, I, I, there's going to be struggles. And, and so I didn't want to leave people with this, like, oh, and now everything's just all good. Boy, it is. And it's beautiful. And I'm so thankful that I'm not where I was. The Lord has walked me so lovingly and patiently out of the life I was in. Um, but I pray that in six months and in a year, he's walking me out of where I'm at now. You know, um, so this is a journey of sanctification. This is not a one and done. You know, Jesus isn't a one hit wonder. He's not a magician. Um, he's, he says, I call you friend. He calls me his beloved. He calls me his bride, right? Like, um, and so I want to fall in love with him. And when you're in love with someone, you want to be with them every day. You want to hear from them. You want to talk to them. You want to, you, you want to give your life to them. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's very unfinished. <laughs> was it, was there a particular, um, aha moment when you realized that you weren't going to do it yourself and, and that you had to kind of turn it over to the Lord? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so it was actually uh, by the grace of God, I got cheated on by the last girl that I dated. Um, and that was kind of when I just reflected. I'm like, wait a minute, what am I doing? You know, I keep pointing the finger at everybody, but there's three pointing back at me. Like, I got to take an evaluation of myself here. I mean, I guess I didn't have to, but, you know, it's just, it's so stupid to lie to yourself. For me, it was, it was like, you know, am I really going to do this? Um, and so I just realized, like, I'm the problem. <laughs> it's me. Like, yeah, sure. They've got some problems too. We all do. But like, these repeated issues and the lack of peace and this, this, you know, everything, I'm going to take accountability for this. And so when I looked at that, I was like, oh my gosh, I've been playing God. I've been making my own rules. I've been taking what I want and leaving what I don't. And in turn, I'm recreating what I think or believe God is. And, and so I was like, you know what? It was October 17th, 2014. I said, I surrender. I said, Jesus, I give you everything I am. I give you my desire for women. I give you, you know, when I moved to Ethiopia, I had given, you know, the material and all that stuff, but I, I held on to one, my fear of being alone uh, and two, my desires for women and, and, you know, companionship. And so I said, Jesus, I'm no longer going to, cause I, I, all my life, I prayed, God, take this from me, take these feelings from me. Um, and on October 17th, 2014, it was very clear that I'm done asking him to take it. I'm going to give it to him because, you know, the world says, you know, love is give and take. No, love is give and receive, right? And so I, I decided, I was like, you know what? And by the grace of God, was I able to even know this? Um, I said, I give you my life. I give you my sexuality. I give you my fears. I give you my future. I give you all that I am. And I need you to be God of my life because I'm doing a horrible job. I said, thank God. I'm thankful that you're God and I'm not. And I need you to start being God. How did your life change at that point? Uh, what was the next several weeks, months like? Oh, it was it was radical. I go through the details um, of the prayer meeting I went to that evening, and, and I suggest <laughs> if you have any interest to read that, it's it's just such the beauty of how God works. Um, but yeah, the months to follow were just unbelievable. I felt like I was on a honeymoon. Um, really, um, my desires began to change. You know, I was prayed over and I was slain in the spirit, and so. I believe that there was something supernatural, right? A miracle really did happen that that evening on October 17th. Um, but but just because there's a miracle, right? When the blind man now can see, he still has to look, <laughs> right? And when the when the lame man can now walk, he's still got to walk. And so for me, yes, I was I was healed and set free in many ways, but I still had to walk this out and and invite the Lord into it. And so, I mean, I just wanted my taste buds changed, like. I wanted more of the Lord. I wanted to read his word. Anything that looked, smelled, or tasted like Jesus, I wanted it. I was a daily mass. I was, I mean, it just, the, the sin was, was, had lost its luster. 
um, because I was like, oh my gosh, it was as if I had realized I was eating, um, I go back to food again. It was like, as if I was eating McDonald's my whole life. Right. And then all of a sudden God laid before me this banquet of healthy, you know, I'm in California, I see you know, San Diego, so we're gluten-free, vegan, da, da, da. But so he laid before me this just amazing banquet. And it was like, I can't go back to McDonald's. I don't even want it. Like I saw now what I was consuming. And I'm not just talking homosexuality. I'm talking about the selfishness, the the materialism. I mean, you name it, it's all in there. Um, and so for me, it was, it was just so amazing. And the more I fed on the Lord, the more I wanted him. It was like an endless, an endless, um, just, a rye of all that I could have. Like I couldn't get enough of him. And the more I wanted, the more I received. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was incredible. And it still is to this day. Now there's been, there's been falls, there's been struggles and trials and there always will be. Uh, he didn't promise us a life free of struggle, a life free of temptation. No, he says that in every struggle, in every temptation, he will be my strength. And now I know that. Now I know that it is not in my strength. I am not strong. I am weak and it is in my weakness that I can now say, Lord, I need you. I need you to be my strength. And that's why Paul in the scriptures, right, boasts of his weakness, not to celebrate his weakness, but he boasts of his weakness or was in that place God would be strong because he was humble enough to say, I can't do this, Lord. I can't do this. I need you. And that's why Jesus came to save us, right? Not yeah. once, but forever. Yeah. Kim, this has been a fascinating half hour. It's a it's a remarkable story. God bless you. The book is uh, again um, entitled "Restless Heart: My Struggle with Life and Sexuality." It's published by a Crisis Publications, which is an imprint of the Sophia Institute Press. It's available just about anywhere you can find a book. And uh, Kim, thank you so much for being with us here on the Storytellers. Truly blessed. Thank you, Johnny. And that's our show for today. The program premieres at 6 p.m. on Wednesday evenings on YouTube at the Fiat Ministry Network and at my website, TonyAgnesi.com. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single issue. The radio program is produced by The Living Bread Radio Network, airs at 4 p.m. on Sundays on The Living Bread Radio Network. And the podcast is available at thestorytellersradio.com and wherever you get your podcasts. This is Tony Agnesi. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time on the next edition of The Storytellers. God bless you.